for tech companies in general in Indonesia, uh, what sort of impact do you think TPP will, will have on them? We, we talk about like the increased uh, regulatory responsibility, particularly with data protection uh, and transmission. Is that something which will actually impact Indonesian companies or startups in particular in a meaningful way? Huge, or is it something hugely? Do you think so? I think uh, I think. Uh, the tech industry in particular should be extremely heartened. Mm -hmm. I should uh, view this as a, as a big positive uh, because, uh, uh, to my knowledge, TPP actually, again, forces everyone to be very rational in yeah. technology, right? Like, uh, uh, for example, on, uh, on, on uh, sovereignty of data, what it proposes is that yes, uh, governments can have lawful access and we can give you the encryption keys, uh, but it makes no sense to force the data to be here, right? I mean, the data can be anywhere, and, and in fact, if you force the, the data to be localized, you lose, you obviously lose the global scale economies of you know, a, a worldwide uh, network of data centers. Um, local content requirements. Um, you know, very controversial, especially in electronics uh, and, uh, and and smartphones and mobile devices. Uh, local content requirements, obviously, we have them, uh, and TPP, you know, would force us to do, do away with them. Uh, now, personally, again, I, I like to smile, and here's where my maverick or gadfly yeah. comes in, right? Like sometimes I I point out in these meetings, guys, you know, we're fighting so hard to attract these factories. Yeah. Yeah, for making smartphones and devices and you know what we call high-tech jobs. Yeah. But two things. First of all, I believe that you know over the next ten years, hardware prices will be driven way down. Right? They'll be very commoditized, and I can imagine a day when a smartphone is like a pocket calculator. You know, it's it's so cheap. It's just mass-produced. It's free. Uh, there's very little value in that. Second of all. Uh, why? Partly because probably in five or seven or eight years, all those things will be made by robots. Mm -hmm. right? If you look at the advances in automation and robotics, I think you know I can imagine in, whether it's five, seven, or twelve years, there might be no more humans involved in making these things, right? So, and more of the value might come in the applications and the services, right? Uh, so, you know, and this is happening so fast. One can almost imagine that by the time TPP comes into effect. Uh, you know, it's, it's already, you know, local content records already moot, right? Yes, by that point, the, the yeah. impact of the 40% rule will be so much smaller than people yeah. say, yeah. So, but for now, mm -hmm. what I believe is TPP forces us to start having more intelligent conversations around these issues. <laughs> so, uh, we're, we're going to get into the, the Q&A pretty soon, uh, but there's a, a couple of things that I kind of want to talk about your own personal vision. We've talked a lot about uh, how the administration can kind of form and reform. We've talked about uh, the investment trends and the excitement in Indonesia. Uh, but for you yourself, um, there are certain there are initiatives that uh, the president has. But like, what is your pet project? What is the thing that maybe someone says, you're still working on that? You're like, no, I'm serious, guys. <laughs> this is the thing. You know, David, uh, ironically, what I, what I hope for is, uh, is for Indonesia and Indonesians not to lose what is really unique about us. You know, um, I think we're a remarkably relaxed people. We're very warm and welcoming and open. Uh, we have an amazing sense of humor, right? Um, sometimes in the society, uh, we we might not be you know, the most intense or hardworking, uh, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure we have to go in that direction. You know, I think uh, uh, yes, we, we want material prosperity, right? We want progress. Uh, obviously, we want everyone to get richer, right? But I think you know, I think we still want our people to be rukun, ramah. You know, like. Uh, uh, fun and, and relaxed and, uh, and just all those things that are so unique in Indonesia. So, is that, can you have both things? Because I think so. 
I, I, I don't like my my perspective on the kind of visionary top level tech bosses, uh, Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, etc., uh, uh, Bill Gates. They are hard charging. They I don't know if Steve Jobs is very funny. <laughs> like that's the image that I have. Can you can can you have both things? Can you can you maintain uh, this very important culture, the, the you know legacy of the country, and still create uh, that sort of like insane tech empire? Uh, I think so. I think so. Uh, I mean, technology is a tool, right? Uh, and people use it in different ways. Uh, and uh, uh, I think in any society, you're gonna have a subset of hard charging, you know, rebel innovators and all that. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think society as a whole, right? And again, it, it comes down to leadership, I believe. I think leadership uh, is to ensure that balance, right? that on the one hand we're internationalizing, we're modernizing, you know, we want to become more competitive, all these things, but uh, not at the cost of, of losing our culture or uh, uh, our traditions and so on. Uh, and I think, you know, personally, I think so far so good. So in terms of that leadership, we have great examples like yourself, but how do you really seed the upper echelons uh, of, of the public, because you need leaders, at least in my theory, leaders are more made than they are born. I, I think that there's a series of experiences, a series of challenges that people have to go through to really learn how to be an effective leader. Just my own personal theory. And I think we see similar, I don't know, sorry, I'm based in Japan, this is the first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, take Solfeng. Solfeng, before they found Nikesh, they were trying to find a successor from Masayoshi Son. So they literally created a academic program, and they would pick up like the best and brightest in Japan. I didn't make it, but they would pick up the best and brightest in Japan, and they they try to teach them how to be like amazing leaders. Like, is, do you think that sort of a program is necessary for for Indonesia? Like, how do you create this level of leadership that you want? So you know, it's funny. I was uh, over the weekend in uh, my what I could call my hometown of Manado, uh, and you know, while I was there for official reasons. It so happened to be that there was a conference of uh, all the business schools in the country. So all the MBA programs in the country from east to west were all meeting up there for a conference. And so they asked me to speak, right? And they asked me about innovation. They asked me about innovation and, uh, and inventiveness and, uh, and, and technology and, and all that. And I, I pointed out one, you know, one funny thing. Uh, I told them, you know, when I was in Silicon Valley, I was told that two-thirds of the founders of these startups were all immigrants. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of, look, uh, I think, you know, if you ask me how to foster innovation, you know, there's part of me that wants to point out that innovators, a lot of times, are weird people. You know, they're kind of crazy people. Uh, oftentimes, they can be minorities. Uh, they can be very eccentric, uh, and so, ironically, I think our tolerance for minorities, for eccentric people, for weird people, right, for mavericks, it's actually very important because those are the people who will challenge, right? Those are the rebels. Uh, so compare that with other societies, which are more, you know, monolithic or conformist or not so tolerant. You know, that's an example of what I think is a very nice part of an Asian culture. Now, like, confronted with eccentric or different, I still think the majority of us just shrug. You know, it's like, okay, whatever. You know, and, and actually, if you think about it, it's quite important, right? Right. Like, if, you know, if we were a very monolithic culture where, or even militaristic, uh, where we frown on, uh, on, uh, on eccentric, or weird, you know, that's not pro-innovator and, uh, you know, challengers to the established order. Uh, I think one, one thing which I think we started to change, uh, certainly in the bureaucracy, in 
in some ways in Indonesian society, sometimes we're so scared to be blamed. You know, we're, we're so scared to make a mistake, or so scared to fail. And as many of us know, in Silicon Valley, failure is celebrated. Right? Mistakes are great, okay? Well, thank God we found out that didn't work, right? Let's, yeah. uh, let's quickly fix it and move on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, certainly in my ministry, we're, we're trying to change the culture. It's astonishing. People are so scared to be, to be blamed or to, to admit, oh, whoops, we made a mistake. Uh, so, and, and I believe that cultural change can actually happen quite quickly, you'd be surprised. So, last question for me before we turn it over to the audience. Uh, one thing that's really impressive, we, we've talked a lot about potential reforms, but there's already reforms in place. I was reading that the uh, permit to uh, process an investment went from eight days to three hours. Uh, there's the lowering of the, uh, you must hire, uh, the limit on non-Indonesian hires uh, for companies. Uh, and from what you were saying before, it sounds like we'll be hearing some pretty positive news related to the, the negative investment list before too long. With, it seems like there's a great head of steam and TPP is along the way too. And here we have like this conference and you here and all this energy. If you were to forecast five years in the future, even 10 years in the future, what does Indonesia's digital economy look like? What, what do you see? You know, I would imagine that uh, smartphones would be everywhere, would be widespread, like every man, woman, and child, you know, would have one. I mean, they'd be lying around on the, you know, the table, you might pick one up. Uh, it would recognize who you are and immediately customize itself around you, right? Uh, so mobile would be everywhere. Uh, and, uh, and similar to maybe the Philippines, uh, you know, I, I think we're quite a chatty, quite a sociable society. Uh, so I would imagine uh, you know, social media uh, will be everywhere. Um, I think it's going to be un unorganizable. I, I do. I don't think we have self-driving cars here. Self-driving so Gojek. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but for example, drones. Mm. Uh, I was in East Java at a uh, smaller city called Banyuwangi, and uh, for a batik, you know, festival, mm. and. Uh, you know, it's quite a stunning fashion show. It was so sophisticated. Uh, I thought I was in Tokyo or in Paris or something. But sure enough, they had a couple of video drones oh, nice. flying around and taking the footage of, of the event. I see, I see. Um, on uh, National Day uh, a ceremony at the palace, um, you know, my wife and I were honored to be able to attend, of course, the festivities, you know, National Day, uh, you know, Independence Day. And there was drones flying around. I wish I knew you like drones. We have a drone. We were going to use it tomorrow. <laughs> okay. It's too late. I'm sorry. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, uh, of course, the tech sector and digital economy ultimately cannot separate from the physical infrastructure and the old economy, right? And I think whilst we try to not get in the way of everything that you're doing, I hope we can at least take care of all the basics and right? make sure we've got ample and reliable electricity. You know, we've got good transportation systems and transportation infrastructure so that e-commerce goods can get shipped easily and efficiently around the country and in and out of the country. Uh, we hope to have streamlined regulations so that you don't have to fill up so many forms uh, or hire an army of clerical staff. Uh, to ensure compliance with, you know, long lists of requirements. Uh, so yeah, I think, uh, I think, you know, even within a five-year Jokowi term, potentially two, you know, five-year Jokowi terms, uh, I think, you know, there'll be a lot of change, and, and I'm, I'm quite optimistic it'll, it'll be, the country will be unrecognizable. I can't wait five, six, or seven years.